And Lord, just let your word go forth today. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. So, today we are going to talk about pastors. We've been talking about the fivefold ministry. Um, so today I wanted to go over the, the pastor uh, mantle and assignment um, in the uh, in the fivefold found in Ephesians 4. Uh, but we're not going to read out of Ephesians 4. Turn with me to John chapter 10. So, here we go. So, pastors are the most misconstrued of all of the, of the fivefold um, mantles that we read of in Ephesians 4. I think it's the most misconstrued. I think it is the, probably the most popular, the one that people have heard of the most. Um, and at the same time, the most misunderstood and probably, if we're being honest, in the American Western Church, at least, probably the most dysfunctional and out of order uh, in its application. All right, and what I mean by that is, you know, when you, when you go to a church, usually one of the first questions that pops into your mind is never, you don't walk in the church and say to one of the ushers, hey, who's the prophet here? Right? In fact, that would probably be a weird question to ask. You wouldn't necessarily say, hey, who is the, uh, who's the apostle of the house? Doesn't really happen much. If you ask for the teacher, they might say, oh, you mean for Sunday school? Um, Sunday school is over at, you know, whatever, 1045, whatever. It's always, who is the pastor? We have the term, the senior pastor. Um, it's a very, um, it's, 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 it's a very, uh, I should say, I don't want to necessarily even say American. It's a very westernized application. That doesn't mean it's wrong necessarily, um, but there's a certain order that this is to fall into if we want to complete the full container of the way that Jesus meant for the church to function. Amen? So the term senior pastor is not in the Bible. It's never been there. There's the word pastors there. Senior pastor, though, is our application. And what has really, if we're being honest, in most churches, what it has meant is it has meant who is the guy who's going to feed us all of our needs. He, we entrust him for apostolic leadership. We entrust him to hear from God and prophetic leadership. We entrust him to be our chief teacher. And we entrust him to kind of do a little bit of evangelism maybe and just kind of like make sure all the programs are working well. And while again, this isn't necessarily, it, in, 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 in itself, these are not bad assignments, but there is an order that God has ordained and I believe that in this hour of human history, guys, we have been praying for revival. We've been singing about a move of God. We've been believing for a move of God. And the Lord in his mercy is saying, yes, I'm going to answer your prayer. Enter COVID and all of this craziness. And we're like, what? We thought you were going to send revival God. And he's like, I am. But in order to do it, I need to take the church, I need to turn it upside down, I need, to un I need the church to unlearn some things, learn some new things, so I can build the container that I died for, for the glory to come, so that when the glory comes, we can contain it, and we can carry it, and we can be with him and dwell with him, and actually see his kingdom manifest on the earth. Amen? Amen? Amen. And this is what he's doing right now. So the term pastor, the term pastor means shepherd. In fact, in most languages, I don't even think there's a difference between pastor and shepherd. It's just one word, right? In Italian, isn't it the same word, pastor and shepherd? 
So it means shepherd is what, is, where, is what the word pastor means. When you look at the Hebrew Bible, when you go to the Greek, wherever you go to, the word is not pastor. It's actually shepherd. So what I want to talk about is I want to talk about one, what is the biblical function of the pastor? And then two, what does that mean to you and me with regard to how we carry it and walk it out in our everyday lives? Okay, I want to first start by saying this. Because we have associated pastor with senior pastor of a church, many times we are very easy to dismiss that one when we read it. But it is very, very possible for you to have a pastoral calling on your life and never once serve as a pastor in a church. You know, pastor doesn't just mean I, the guy who preaches and stands up. Some people say, I'm a little, you know, I don't do well speaking in front of crowds, I, so pastor can't be for me. And the Lord would say, no, that actually has nothing to do with it at all. Pastor is an assignment and an attitude of the heart and how we walk out in our everyday life. So I could be looking absolutely at a room full of pastors right now, even if you never intend to pastor a church. So if we're in John 10, I'm just going to read this. How many know that Jesus was the greatest pastor who ever lived? Amen. Love it. You guys are so like responsive today. This is a really easy one to preach to. Jesus is the greatest pastor who ever lived. Jesus, during his ministry walked out all five mantles with excellence. Jesus, the apostle, raised up the 12 apostles below him and baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the evangelist, brought in a whole host with him of captives. Jesus, the teacher, taught the multitudes with excellence and with sharpness. Jesus, the prophet, uttered the things of God and walked out in signs and wonders what the Old Testament prophets would do and even greater. And Jesus, the pastor, was the shepherd of the sheep. And he goes into this in John 10. I'm going to start with verse 2. And then we'll read all the way down to... We're just going to read a bunch. I just want I want I want this to like just wash over us. So if you don't have it open, just close your eyes and receive. Starting in verse 2. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was trying to say to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Who's they? The sheep. I am the good shepherd. Literally, he's saying, I am the good pastor. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and sees the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So, what is the function of a shepherd or a pastor? Well, I believe that the, the reason he calls him a shepherd, it's not because if you're a shepherd, you're called to lead animals, right? Like Jesus, the, one of the fivefold ministries is not leading actual sheep. With a key, like, you know, like one of the little like rods. No, why does he call it a shepherd? Because I believe it is a perfect reflection 
for what the pastor is called to do. It is a perfect reflection of what the pastor is called to do. What does the shepherd do? Well, the shepherd leads the sheep. He leads them where they are to go. The shepherd protects the sheep. When there's a wolf that comes, the shepherd pulls out his weapon or rod or whatever, and he stands in between the wolf and the sheep. The shepherd nurtures the sheep. You see, being a shepherd is not glamorous. It's not, the, the shepherds of the day did not dress in the best clothes and drive the nicest cars. They weren't even really paid that much. They were hired by somebody who actually owned the sheep. In some cases, they owned the sheep, but in most cases, I imagine, the sheep were owned by a rich guy who had livestock. And then what he would do is he would hire a shepherd, and the shepherd would even live amongst the sheep. He would basically say, I want you, these are my children, and I want you to take care of them, essentially. And day in and day out, the shepherd would clip their nails. He would, he would, he would bring, he, you know, he would cut the wool off of them. In fact, the, he would anoint their head with oil because what would often happen was, this is a really cool, you know, in Psalm 23, we, we hear the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. And, and, and at some point, he says he anoints my head with oil. Why does he do that? Because what would happen, and I think we've probably said this here before, my dad's probably said it, is that, the, that flies, which carry disease and would multiply and all this stuff, they would literally torment the sheep. They would find their way into the sheep's like wool and hang out in there. And in many times what they would do is they would literally fly into the sheep's ears and they would lay eggs in there and it would drive the sheep's insane. It was irritating, it was, it, was, uh, it was painful, and sometimes the sheep would even, I've heard that the sheep would even go mad and run themselves into rocks, run their, their heads into rocks, just to try to get rid of the pain of what was being bred inside their heads. So what the shepherd would do is he would anoint the sheep's head with oil, and the oil would flow into the ears and outside the ears, and between the thickness of it, it would, it, would, it would make it a protective coating, and the smell would keep the flies away. That'll, that, that's a message for a whole other day. So the shepherd was responsible to tend to the sheep every day, day in, day out. The dirty work, cleaning up after them. In fact, David says in Psalm 23, he says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Why does he say that? You see, the rod and the staff represented discipline. So when the shepherd was leading the sheep, when the sheep would go off on the wrong path, the shepherd's rod would strike them, wouldn't abuse them, but there was a little bit of the discipline there so that they learned to stay inside where the staff was and where the rod was. They, they learned to follow the shepherd. It was the dirty work. You had to train the sheep. When the lamb is born, it doesn't know where to go. It's born, it's great, it's cute, but it doesn't know what to do. The shepherd needed to literally raise it. And the sheep learned to be comforted by the sight even of the staff because they knew as long as we follow the staff, we'll be going in the right direction. What else happened? Jesus said, what good, he says, what does a good shepherd do? If you have a hundred sheep and one of them runs off, the shepherd actually leaves the 99 behind in order to go get the one. Why did he say that? Because it spoke even to the, it spoke even to the individuality of the fact that the shepherd knew every single sheep in his flock. There was relationship there. It wasn't a matter of, oh, well, you know, Bob died, 
Bob the sheep, he died. And well, Bob, it's okay, at least I have 99 more. No, he grieved over Bob. He loved Bob. He ran after Bob. But what does this all tie into? Jesus says something in John 10 that we just read that I think speaks to the greatest part of the responsibility of the shepherd. He said, my sheep hear my voice. And the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. What does that mean? Because of the day in and day out clipping of the nails and trimming of the wool and striking with the rod and anointing with oil, and the tender growth, because of that history, what it resulted in was a connection and a relationship between the sheep and the shepherd, where the sheep literally would only follow the voice of the shepherd. Meaning if the shepherd said, run into that thorn bush, and a stranger said, run into that open pasture, the sheep would walk into the thorn bush because it trusted the voice of the shepherd before it trusted the voice of a stranger. Why? Because the history behind that voice taught the sheep. It anchored something in the sheep that I can trust this voice. You see, the pastor and his role is rooted in relationship. The pastor's role is not rooted in preaching. The pastor's role is not rooted in building the ministry. The pastor's role is not rooted in hearing God on behalf of the people. The pastor's role is in taking the baby lambs and raising them day in and day out, cultivating a relationship, cultivating the place so that the actual, the sheep actually Feel comfortable, and I don't even like the word comfortable, safe, where the sheep feel safe and trusting himself to the shepherd, where the people actually feel like there has been, there is, there has been relationship here where I actually feel safe and trusting myself to the leadership of another. You see, it's very important that the pastor never needs the sheep. That the pastor never needs the people. It's important that this all, you see, when I, when I grew up, okay, my dad, forget the fact that he's a pastor, right now he's just my dad, okay? I needed my dad. There was a season in my life where I needed my dad to feed me, to change me, to dress me, to clean me, right? I needed that. At no point during our relationship did my father ever need something from me. He never, he never fed me so that I could get something out of me. He never clothed me so that he could get something out of me. It was always, he was committed to me for me. It was never for what he could get out of it. And as I got older, I learned how to dress myself. I learned how to feed myself. And you know what? It was my father's responsibility to teach me that. If at 30 years old, I still needed my dad to feed me, and I still need my dad to dress me, my dad was a really bad dad, if that was the case. Right? right. But because of me, because of what was good for me, he sowed into my life. Do we understand now why it's dysfunctional for people who have been going to church for five and 10 and 20 and 30 years to need Sunday morning to feed them. When people say, I left the church, and you say, why? And they say, because I wasn't being fed. I have a problem with that. I have no problem with people leaving churches, by the way. I don't think, I actually don't, I don't think it's the, you know, in, in church history, I think that I'll get to why, but there's been such a dysfunctional thing that has stirred up in, in, in ministry, in ministers, where, where ministers minister out of insecurity, and I'm ministering to you because I need you to come so that I feel good about the amount of people that are here and how good my ministry is doing. 
And when somebody left, instead of blessing them and sowing to them financially and saying, we honor you in the new season that the Lord is calling you to, they would crucify them. And it was, hey, did you hear about her? You know, she, she left. They left. As if they, you know, committed murder or something. I mean, my God. So I'm, I, 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 when God is leading somebody somewhere, I'm for it. But I tell you what, if you leave one church so that you can go get fed somewhere else, it's dysfunctional. You're not supposed to get fed from your pastor at the ch- at, at, I mean, from, from, from your church, from the ministry. Amen? Can we, can we learn here? But the pastor is the one that teaches you to eat for yourself. So there's a season where the pastor feeds you. Right? And then there's a season where you show up for meal and there's utensils in front of you. And he says, and he said, I thought you were doing the whole train thing. Open up your mouth, the train's coming. <laughs> Say, nope, no train today, buddy. There's a spoon right next to that food. There's a fork right next to that food. Pick it up. But I, th- I like the train. The train's easy. No more train. Now you're gonna pick it up. Okay, you pick it up. Okay, now stick it in here. Do that, and what happens? As you do, now you've, you've cultivated something. And as the pastor cultivates that stuff in people, what you do is you do it from a place of selflessness. Now I wanna tell you guys a story. Before I tell you the story, I wanna, I'll, I'll segue by saying this. It's very important Turn your neighbor and say, very important. It is very important. This is the key to a pastor staying in a healthy relationship with the sheep. It is very important that the pastor stay and be submitted to an apostolic and a prophetic leadership team. It is very important that the pastor stay submitted to an apostolic and a prophetic ministry team or oversight team. Why? Because what did we learn about the apostle? The apostle is receiving vision from the Lord. They're receiving the burning from God. They're setting things into motion. The prophet is seeing what God is doing. They're, they're, they're receiving the word of the Lord and they're, and, they're, and they're speaking to the apostles and the apostles are networking and building the systems. They're executing that which the prophet has seen. They're putting everything into motion, right? And that comes from the heart of God. The heart of God is for people, not for, not for my ego, not for the ego of the church, the ego of the ministry team. It's for people to grow up into the head, which is Christ, right? We learned about this? Okay, when the pastor is submitted to the apostolic and the prophetic leadership team, it's impossible for him to minister out of insecurity. It's possible for him to need the people. I need you to join the ministry team, otherwise I'm mad at you. I need you to have a good church attendance record, otherwise I'm mad at you. I need you to make sure you call me and we do this, otherwise I'm mad at you. It's never been about that. The pastor lays down his life for the sheep. He lays down his, his, his rights. And the, 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 the determining factor of whether or not the pastor will have a healthy relationship with his flock or will not will be if he's submitted to an apostolic leadership team. Okay? Because if he does that, he's following another. He's literally walking out what he is teaching his sheep to do, which is submit yourself to a higher form of authority. I want to tell you a story of two different pastors in the Bible. One of them that was committed to the people and broke the leadership with the apostle and the prophet. And one who was submitted to the apostolic and the prophetic. First one was a man named Saul. He was the first king of Israel. He was anointed by the prophet and back then the prophet that the apostle had not come forth yet. So the prophet was walking in the apostolic and the prophetic mantle together. And it was the prophet Samuel. Okay, Saul was anointed king over the people of Israel. He was literally anointed to be their shepherd, 
to protect them, to make a home for them, to raise up a system and government around them. He was anointed by God. He was not some guy who was just trying to reach through the ladder. He actually was anointed by God. The most accurate prophetic word ever. You are going to be the king of Israel. He had every skill. He, had, he was the perfect image of what you would want in a pastor. Maybe he had the nice suit, really good communicator. Okay? Looked really great on the campaign posters. Kissed babies. You know, did all that stuff. He was, a really, he was really good on the surface. But what ended up happening was his heart broke agreement with submission to a higher authority. And he was no longer trustworthy to lead the people because he was, his ego was fed by his authority that he had over the people. So what ended up happening was in 1 Samuel, you can read from 1 Samuel chapters 13 to 15, you can read both instances where he, where he sinned and broke, and broke assignment with what he was called to do. The first time was when he, he lived the sacrifice was the first time. Sacrifice was first. Where Samuel told him to wait, to bring the people out and to wait for him to arrive so that he could light the sacrifice. But after seven days, Samuel still hadn't showed up yet. So Saul saw the people in front of him and he, he saw them starting to grumble. He saw them not being super happy in the church meeting with the way the chairs were situated or with the way the paint colors were or with the way the songs that the worship team was singing. And he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to I need to make the people happy. Otherwise, they're not going to like me as much. They're not going to revere me as much. They're not going to bring me gifts on Pastor Appreciation Sunday. And I really I, I, I need that. I need the people to like me. So he lit the sacrifice. And right when he lit the sacrifice, when he wasn't supposed to, Samuel came and said, what did you do? And he said, the people were getting frustrated. And Samuel said, well, unfortunately, you weren't called to follow the people. You were called to follow God. And then a little bit later, God gave him another assignment. God said, go into this, this, um, this kingdom, this wicked kingdom, and I want you to kill everyone and everything. Everyone and everything. Don't bring anything back. Don't bring anything into our camp. We want everyone and everything to be destroyed. And he said, okay. And he went in and he killed everyone and everything that didn't cost him anything but the riches and the good livestock he kept for himself. And then instead of killing the king like he was supposed to, he brought the king into captivity so that he could show off to all the people what he did. What they would do back then is if you were to capture a kingdom, you would keep the king in like a cage and like... Basically, he was like a trophy to you. It was, it was a pride thing to show, look what I did. I took this massively powerful king and I, I, I've, he submitted to me now. He's in a cage. Because Saul wanted the credit of the people. And Samuel came and said, what did you do? You disobeyed the Lord. He said, and you know what? Because your heart is gone and is far from God, he says, the Lord is taking the kingdom from you. He did this in front of all the people. Can you imagine? And Samuel turned away to walk and Saul grabbed him and said, wait, Samuel. He says, bless me in front of the people. What? I just told you you betrayed the God of the universe and you're, you're embarrassed in front of them? You just want them to? You're not asking me, you know, Figure out how the Lord will forgive me. Oh my God, Samuel, what do I have to do to make this right? Samuel, what have I done? Samuel, I'm repenting. His heart did, it wasn't even towards God. His whole, if you asked him right there, what's the worst thing that just happened here? It wasn't God is no longer pleased with me. It was the people are no, they no longer look at me. They don't, they don't look up to me anymore. Why? Because he broke agreement with the prophetic and the apostolic voice in his life. He let the people get to his head. And then the second king, what Samuel said there in that episode is he said, you know what, Saul? He said, the Lord has taken the kingdom away from you and he's given it to someone who's better than you. Enter 17-year-old, short, freckle-faced, red-headed David, who was a shepherd. God found a shepherd 
after his own heart and anointed him king and raised him up and placed him in a palace. And you know what? David became very, very famous, just like Saul. All the ladies wanted to go out on a date with him. He had all the money he could ever want. He was a warrior. The, the Bible says that the, the crowds would cheer with, like, they'd make cheers with his name. Like, I mean, you know, you hear people, USA. You know, I mean, imagine like a whole crowd just like chanting like, David, David, Ken, Ken, King Ken. You know, like, I mean, like, this, this was there. David had every opportunity, just like Saul did, to let this stuff go to his head. And you know what? At one point he did. There was a day where David committed pretty much every bad sin you could ever imagine. He just put it in one conglomerate. He, he committed adultery and killed the woman's husband that he committed adultery with and impregnated her and then tried to lie about it. And the guy actually was one of his closest friends. I mean, just like the ultimate, like, you can make a soap opera. I mean, the fact that they've not made a soap opera about this story is beyond me. It would, it would sell millions of dollars. And then what happened? The prophet in his life, at this point it was Nathan. Samuel was dead. Nathan the prophet walked into David's palace one day and said, David, you sinned before the Lord. You chose your own desires over the desires of God. And he rebuked him just like Samuel rebuked Saul. Only this time, this is in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Only this time, David didn't grab Nathan and say, oh no, is the kingdom gonna get taken from me? He didn't say, oh no, is the ministry gonna get taken from me? Oh no, am I gonna have to sit for six months of restoration before I can preach again? The Bible says David looked at Nathan and he said, I've sinned before the Lord. You see, the fact that, that David had a, had a heart after the heart of God was manifest, not because he was perfect, but because when he made a mistake, the cry of his heart was, God, I just want to be pleasing to you again. God, I just want to get back into alignment with where you called me. And then you know what happened? This, is, this verse makes me cry. Before David could even say, I'm sorry, Nathan said, you know what, David? The Lord has put away your sin. You won't die. You see, God saw the cry, and he said, beyond the weakness, beyond the failure, God saw the cry in David's heart that he just wanted to please him. And because of that, he didn't give David what he deserved. Because God defines us not by our weakness, but by the cry in our spirit. Isn't that amazing? God doesn't define me by my weakness. He defines me by the cry of my spirit. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. This is the heart of the pastor. The heart of the pastor is to be pleasing before the Father and to serve the sheep as if they're his own. Another example that reminds me, it reminds me of when, when John the Baptist said, uh, he said, the friend of the bridegroom, the bride does not belong to the friend of the bridegroom, but to the bridegroom himself. Right? He says, and the bridegroom rejoices. Or the friend of the bridegroom, I should say, rejoices when the bride and the bridegroom come together. He's like the best friend cheering, just cheering her on. In fact, many, I believe in the, in, the, in, the, in the Jewish wedding ceremony of the day, the friend of the bridegroom, he was the groom's best man, he would go to the town of the bride and make sure that she was getting ready and make sure that she was, that she was getting ready for the day where she would, where she would come to the bridegroom. And he would sow financially into the situation. And he would, he would take time and he would pour into it. And he would, he, would, he would make sure that everything was happening. And you know what? I'm sure there were times where maybe some, some best men were tempted to try to steal the affection of the bride. I'm sure there were times where they were tempted to, to try to steal her away and say, let's run away before the wedding. 
We've got such a good connection. Why do you even like him anyway? No. But the friend of the bridegroom rejoices, the Bible says, when they come together. The heart of the pastor is to lay yourself down for the life of another. Now let me kind of transition this point right here and then we'll close. The call to pastorship is a call to discipleship. And Jesus, before he went back to heaven, after he rose from the dead, after he had already, the Bible says, remember in Ephesians, he died, he went to hell, took the keys of death and Hades from Satan, and when he came back up, he led a host of captives out of the mouth of death into, the, into paradise with God. And as he did it, he came with, with gifts, the fivefold ministry, and he gave gifts to men. And after that, he rose in the tomb, walked out, did miracles among men before he ascended to the Father. And right during that time, after he had already won everything from the place of kingship, he looked at his people and he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, making a disciple is not simply going out and sharing the gospel and leading somebody to Jesus in a prayer. That's important. That's the first step. But I tell you what, if the shepherd gave birth to the lamb and then just left the lamb there and walked away and left it for dead, that lamb would die. That's not what Jesus called us to do. He says, make disciples of all nations. Let me go and say it like this. Make disciples of all spheres of society. Make disciples in your family. Make disciples at school. Make disciples on your campuses and at your workplaces and in your clubs, your places of community. Turn to your neighbor, say, I am a pastor. I am a pastor. Say it, I am a pastor. That's right. Now start calling each other pastor. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> If you have been saved into the kingdom of God, there is, to varying degrees, there is a mantle of pastorship on your life. Some of you will be called to pastor many people. Okay? Some of you might be called to pastor a group of people. Some of you might be called to pastor your children. Some of you are called to pastor one person in your life. But God has called each and every one of us to lay yourself down Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And what do you say the shepherd does? He lays down his life for the sheep. I legitimately want to ask you this question. Maybe some of you guys, you're, you know, your kids are older. Maybe some of you have little kids. Maybe some of you have in-between kids. Maybe some of you don't have any kids. Who can you pastor right now in your life? Who can you identify and say, you know what? This person, I just, I want to give myself in however way I can. It doesn't have to even be an everyday thing or an every week thing, but I want to, I want to hop on a Zoom call with this person once a month and have Bible study with them and just pour into them. I want to, I want to jump on a phone call once a week and have a 30 minute prayer meeting or a 10 minute prayer meeting with this person. And I want this relationship. And whatever that person decides to give me is awesome. But I'm not in this relationship for the dualism of it. I'm in this relationship for what I can give to this person. Meaning if this person never, if I always have to be the initiator, this person never calls me, ever. If I always have to be the one to do it, if this person never responds to me, never even appreciates me, I'm going to lay down my life for them. And I'm gonna be what the Lord called me to be to them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help them come forth and if that means they're going to bear fruit that another would be able to eat from, well, I rejoice. Why? Because the friend of the bridegroom rejoices when the bride and the bridegroom come together. Amen? Let's all stand.
Guys, we are in a new season in the church. The old season has passed away. The winter is gone and the springtime has come. The sound of God is being heard in the land. Beyond the chaos, beyond the anger, beyond the politics, beyond the injustice, beyond all of it, those who have the ears of the Spirit are listening for the voice of the shepherd, the great shepherd, the shepherd who lays his life down for the sheep. The shepherd who doesn't need the sheep, but loves the sheep. If I need you, I can never love you. If you need me, you can never love me. God is raising up shepherds in this hour. Like there's just discipleship. There's a fresh mantle and grace for discipleship right now in this hour. Some of you have little cousins younger cousins or younger siblings maybe the younger sibling is 16 years old and just needs somebody to lead them in this thing to go deep with them to pray with them some of you have neighbors some of you have friends some of you it's people in this church in this room right now You know, the Bible says Paul wrote, I believe, to Timothy. Might have been to somebody else. But he wrote, he said, you know, you have many teachers, but few fathers. You have many people that are willing to take a, a service and teach something. You have many people that are willing to take an opportunity and a platform to gain the eyes of people. But you know you don't have? People who are willing to lay themselves down for something that has nothing in it for them. For the sake of another. Every single one of you, I don't care if you've known Jesus for five minutes, you have the ability to pastor someone, to lead someone. You have the ability to pour into someone, to make a commitment. Maybe you've done it in the past and you've kind of just emotionally and mentally checked out. That's what he's called us to do. And you know what? I'm even thinking this now, on the other foot, some of you, the Lord's redefining what it looks like for you to be pastored. Some of you maybe have had wrong expectations of what you're supposed to get out of your church and out of your pastor. And you're realizing, man, I'm a 30-year-old still wearing a diaper. Like it's time for me to put the bottle down, eat the real food, walk out what I've been called to walk out. The tools have been given to me. It's time for me to just like rock into a new gear here. Learn how to serve. Learn how to eat on my own. And bring then the, the nutrients that I, that I receive to the body and to pour into others. Father, give us grace. Holy Spirit, give us grace. Jesus, you're the great pastor. You are the good shepherd. You know your sheep and your sheep know you. You've built relationship with us. You've built trustworthiness with us. Lord, we ask that you'd give us your heart, that you'd wreck us for servanthood with others. You would wreck us for pastorship, for the mantle of the pastor. God, I ask you to raise up pastors in this place. Lord, pastors of one and two and three, and pastors of one and two and three hundred. God, raise us up. Let this place, God, not just be a cesspool of, of people just coming and just staying and, and sitting in our own whatever. But God, let this place be an apostolic training yes. center. Lord, where people yes. come even for a season yes. to, to receive and to learn and to grow. And then they would go out and they would bring the kingdom to their societies. 
and to their, their spheres and, and to their influences. And they would start churches. They would plant churches, God. And that we would be faithful to support them, to not need them and be offended, but to pour into them financially, God. To pour into them with our resources, with our efforts. Look, the kingdom of God will be made manifest. God, that we would be a people who are a friend of the bridegroom. That we would not minister out of insecurity. That we would not come to church out of insecurity. God, but that we would just receive in the secret place that which you have for us. And that we would walk in authority, pour it out and give it to others. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We love you. We thank you, God. And Lord, now we go. Fire in our bellies. Passion in our hearts, God. Clothed in the love of God. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God bless you. Go in peace.